Tuamak Hill is known for its archaeological remains of the Hohokam in a trinchera site. And there are petroglyphs all over the top. Some of them are even suggestive of possibly being aware of the sky and keeping track of the seasons and all that. So when we decided to put a telescope up there, we had to be rather careful. Gerard Kuiper, who founded the Lunar Lab, acquired two missile tracking telescopes, and he put one on the north side and one on the south side, and went up there every evening for almost a year to check the seeing. He would look through the telescope and see what the image quality was like, and ultimately chose the south side because that's the wind pattern comes from the southwest, and uh, the seeing is better that way. Tumamak Hills, just west of downtown, along with Sentinel Peak, A Mountain, uh, two volcanic structures, Vinia Stewart. He was interested in things like the sunspot cycle. He got, he got Stewart Observatory going, and 36-inch telescope was not quite the largest, but the largest of the only American-made telescopes uh, at the time. Well, this is a map that I constructed while we were site testing uh, Tumamak Hill of the archaeological remains. The summit is surrounded by these walls, defensive walls. There's a road that comes up and has disturbed part of the summit. You put these uh, site testing telescopes, one in the, in the north, right about here, and the other one, the south, was here. When it was under construction, they put a, put a tower up and we put little locations where uh, we could see what the wind was like at different ele elevations. This, this informed us as to how high we had to make the telescope uh, to avoid the, the ground effects, boundary layers. This is what it looked like in its heyday. And this is a camera with a 100-foot roll of film that we used to image planets. It exposed the date and time on the frame and all that and generated images like these of Jupiter taken in 73, uh, different longitudes of, uh, of Jupiter. And we observed Saturn, but also Mars. After the 70s, when we started getting spacecraft images of the planet, it was less important to get ground-based synoptic coverage. So I modified the telescope to follow Comet Halley when it came in. We had a, a, one of the early CCD systems, and here's a picture of the telescope and me I was pouring in liquid nitrogen in the uh, doer. And we managed to image a comet every clear night from about September of 1985 through uh, 86. That was part of the International Halley Watch. I was in charge of the near, nu near nucleus studies net. And we were looking at structures close to the nucleus. You can never see the nucleus, but uh, you see jets and things like that that uh, are a result of active areas on a rotating nucleus. You guys see some images up there on that poster that were taken by observatories around the world. So we got a continuous coverage of the evolution of these of these jets and ultimately allowed mapping of the location of the of the active areas. And of course that was very important because they were had spacecraft going by and they wanted to know whether there might be a danger in getting sandblasted. Uh, by these particles that are in the coma. And in fact, the Giotto, the European uh, spacecraft, did get dinged by one that knocked it off observing the nucleus, and that was that limited what they got. And I was a guest investigator on the, on the Vega mission that had two spacecraft go by just before that, and they stayed far enough away that they didn't encounter the dust but they didn't have the great resolution of the nucleus either. <laughs> then in the 90s, we were using a telescope in that same Newtonian configuration. We had a program here at LPL, space engineering program, and one of the problems that they were interested in was where can we find potentially useful resources on the moon for 
a man outpost. And so we utilized filters that are in and out of bands that define the mineralogy. Created maps like this that showed where, in this case, where you would find titanium dioxide, which could be mined in on the surface to get oxygen and be able to make maybe even you know rocket fuel and stuff like that. Um, uh, they're still interested in that, by the way. And these have been superseded by spacecraft maps that did the same thing, but much higher resolution. But at the time, that uh, was uh, some of the incremental improvements over uh, in instrumentation. And then we got this great comet Hale-Bopp that came by, and we were able to use uh, that same CCD uh, to to image, in this particular case, the um, carbon dioxide ions that are charged. They, this, this, this is the nucleus over here, and um, there's a little bit of dust here, but the filter is band, band is centered on the emission of the uh, CO plus. And what we see here is the effect of the solar wind pushing up against the material being given out by the comet. Molecules are photodissociated and uh, break up, and CO plus is the one, one of the products. And this stuff changes daily and actually much more rapidly. When we took two of these images 18 minutes apart and subtracted them, you get this which shows that all the structure in here is not moving much at all, but these so-called bow shot waves uh, are moving. You can see real complexity in all this, and we still don't know what some of these other features uh, represent. But this was all done with the Tuamot 20-inch telescope. It was, it was a nice period when we were using it, it was kind of magical up there, knowing knowing the, the prehistoric background and and the fact that it's been undeveloped. It's, it was always amazing to almost finish the night and come out and see perched on a saguaro, a great horned owl silhouetted against the city lights, and then fly off with huge wings. It was just, you know, just, Tumamaka is a very special place, and should be preserved as best as possible for the future so other people can feel the same feeling.